So we have been consistently talking about PCBs in terms of how chips are assembled on top of PCBs to form larger systems. But we haven't really talked about what a PCB is. So a PCB is an, a, a, an acronym that stands for Printed Circuit Board or PCB. And that's the most likely uh, platform upon which independent or individual microchips are combined to form an overall system. So what does a PCB consist of? It consists of a, an insulating substrate. So this could be any kind of uh, insulator, usually uh, some sort of plastic or uh, epoxy or um, anything that is really uh, electrically insulating, provides good thermal radiation and provides good mechanical support. All we ask, ask of it is that it has uh, an insulator. So this forms the substrate upon which everything is uh, assembled together. Uh, upon the PCB, on top of the PCB, we will, we will create tracks of conductive material. This conductive material is usually copper, and these tracks then provide wires that can communicate, that can connect the components of the system together. And so basically the insulator forms the paper upon which we draw the circuit and the tracks form the wires uh, through which we connect all the components. You might actually start to see um, an analogy between PCBs and uh, microchips is in microchips we have a substrate which is formed of pure silicon in that case and you have tracks of materials formed on the on the substrate more uh, appropriately in a microchip on top of the microchip you will have a sea of silicon dioxide and within that sea of silicon dioxide you have tracks of metal one metal two different metals communicating with each other right so yeah, once we get deeper into PCBs and how they are fabricated and how they, uh, they perform communication, you will find that this analogy is actually very apt. So let's look at this setup here, which shows how PCBs can be used to uh, construct the system. So you have a, a PCB of an, uh, a board again formed of an insulating material and then you have footprints here and these footprints indicate locations where you expect that your chips will be installed and then you have copper tracks uh, communicating between these footprints and then in the next step you perform installation of components and so you install uh, all the microchips in their locations uh, this installation can be done manually if the chips are uh, dip uh, uh, packages or surface mounts or it has to be done using specialized equipment, especially in the case of BGAs. And so once this is done, all of these chips are then uh, connected to each other and the whole system is supposed to work properly. Now, there are two issues that we have to discuss here. One of them is how the uh, PCB is designed and the second is how it is fabricated. So let's start with design because it actually uh, exposes us to the similarity or analogy to uh, photolithography. So the design of a microchip is basically going to tell us where the uh, copper tracks are going to be because that's all we need to know. The, the, the PCB itself is going to be an insulating substrate. It's going to come as an insulating substrate and all you create on top of it is the conductive copper tracks. And so all your design is, is where these conductive copper tracks are. And so the design is basically, it just goes uh, the following way. You have a certain amount of real estate, which is your PCB substrate. And then within that substrate, you have to distribute a number of resources, which are your chips or your uh, passive components, because sometimes you need capacitors and resistors to uh, adjust signals for chips. But let's just talk about the case where you only have microchips. And so let's assume that you have three microchips. Uh, and then you have to de determine where exactly on the PCB these microchips are going to be. And now you also need to connect the inputs and outputs, the input pins and the output pins of these microchips in a specific way. Maybe they need to communicate with each other. or Maybe they need to communicate with jacks that come off the PCB. And so now we have to determine ways in which these constraints, because they are constraints, the, this chip needs to communicate with these jacks, 
and then it needs to communicate with this chip through these pins. And then this chip needs to communicate with that chip through these pins. And let's assume that this chip also needs to communicate with this chip. And then it has to do a roundabout so that it doesn't cross over with another wire. So you might find a closure for this problem where you manage to find all the routing uh, tracks that you need to perform all your connections or you might fail. And even if you find a solution which co connects every component to the other, uh, these copper tracks provide a capacitive load. So they provide an additional delay to the delay of the chips themselves. And so maybe you do, you, you manage to find a solution that functionally connects the chips together, but it creates a situation where the delay is now too much and this, the circuit cannot be expected to function properly. In that case, what would you do? What you do is you will try to place the chips in other locations and then do rerouting. So what does this remind you of? It, it definitely reminds us of placement and routing. And the problem is extremely similar to placement and routing. And the design flow is very similar to that of placement and routing. And the optimization algorithms are also very similar. There's one difference though, which is that PCB design is usually less computationally intensive because the constraints that we have are usually a lot more permissive because we have a lot fewer copper tracks on the PCB than we have uh, metal lines within a microchip. But it is actually the same problem, more or less. Once you have this determined the uh, routing tracks that, that you need, let's assume that they are this in this, in this case, then you go to the fabrication stage where you fabricate the PCB. And you know what's surprising here is that the fabrication stage is also very similar to photolithography. So the design flow is very similar to ASIC design flow and fabrication is very similar to photolithography because that's what you're doing basically. You're creating conductive tracks on an insulating substrate. So go back and look at photolithography, go back and look at the locus process and uh, examine how metal tracks were con uh, co uh, constructed using PVD. You will find that this fabrication flow for uh, the PCB is actually very similar. So as you can see in this flow diagram, um, in this flow chart, we begin by finishing the design, which begins by placing the components and then routing between them. You can find a solution or you may fail to find a solution, in which case you need to reiterate. And this is where we said that there's a huge analogy between what's happening and placement and routing. Once you have finished, and of course you will use CAD tools to aid you in this, you then proceed to fabrication. First step in fabrication is to manufacture a mask. And the mask is going to be created very similarly um, to the masks that are created for uh, microchips. So it, it serves ex uh, almost exactly the same purpose, except that in this case, usually the mask is formed of a solid material and the copper tracks are etched in the mask as openings, as actual physical openings. So we are not talking about light in this case. We are actually talking about actual openings. We're not talking about uh, opaque areas and transparent areas. We actually talk about holes that are cut through the mask. Then you have the PCB substrate, which is an, of an appro appropriate size. And the mask and the substrate are going to be roughly the same size because the features that are, are going to be created on the substrate are going to be one-to-one -one with the features on the mask. So there's no real photolithography happening here. This is actual lithography. This is actual um, drawing on stone. Then you coat the entire PCB with copper. Um, this could be done through electrolysis or through uh, sputtering or through any technique that you want to use. And then you align the mask with the PCB and you use an etchant, uh, which in this case could be an acid, to eat through the exposed parts and leave the unexposed parts. In which case you will end up with uh, all of the exposed parts, which is the majority of the, of the mask being removed, and only the copper tracks that you want to remain remaining. Now, uh, this is a very similar process to photolithography, but it, it, it takes place on much larger dimensions, which makes it less expensive and easier. And it also does not need to take place in a very uh, highly controlled environment. Of course, it's going, to be, uh, it's going to happen in a clean environment, but it is not as tightly classified as an environment where uh, microchips are fabricated. 
So one more area in which PCB design is similar to uh, ASIC design and fabrication is when you consider the fact that most practical PCBs are multi-layer. So the simplest way to think about this is that when you fail to find a closure for routing on a PCB, you will need another layer of metal wires through which you can create crossovers. This is very similar to the need for multiple metal layers in ASICs. And the most immediate solution is to create another layer of metal wires on the opposite side of the PCB. This, of course, is very difficult to do when you have uh, dual inline pin chips because dual inline pin chips go through holes in the PCB and thus they uh, occupy both sides of the, of, the, of the PCB simultaneously. But when you have surface mount and BGA chips, you have the other side of the PCB basically being uh, empty and you can use it to deposit and create metal layers independently as is shown here. So you create uh, metal wires on the first layer and you create metal lines on the second layer independently. Now, of course, these two metal layers are gonna need to communicate with each other occasionally because Again, what you need them for is to create crossovers so that you have metal one going horizontally and let's say metal two going vertically and then you need to create a crossover. But at some point, metal two is going to need to go to metal one to, for example, communicate with the pin of a chip on the other side of the, of the board. So you need to create contacts between these two metal layers. And this is created, again, in a way that is very similar to microchips because you cut holes through the PCB and then when you deposit your copper these holes are filled simultaneously and this is very similar to the way vias were created in microchips so if you go back and look at the locus process when we created metal 2 we opened the via 1 layer first and then we deposited material which overfilled via 1 and then created metal 2 which was then um, which was then etched using uh, the metal tool uh, mask. So this is again a similarity to photolithography. Uh, some PCBs require more than two layers. They are multi-layer, they're not just dual layer, in which case you create the first layer of metal wires, you cut holes, and then you create the second layer, and then you deposit insulator on top of the second layer, and then you create via two, and then you create the third metal layer. So this is again, exactly the same as would happen in a microchip, because we are depositing more insulator on top, which is similar to when we deposited more silicon dioxide on top of the chip in order to create a metal three layer. Uh, sometimes you don't actually deposit more PCB insulator on top. What you happen to do is you have another PCB and then uh, you solder them together or you glue them together. But in any case, the analogy with ASICs is, is uh, very clear.